All right, we're going to get started. It is a pleasure and honor to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Helen Gao. She is a professor of medicine in our division, and she was medical director of our UCSF Geriatrics Clinical Services from 2010 to 2016. In 2016, she was the very first faculty member at UCSF at the associate professor level who was selected to join the Council of Master Clinicians, which just reinforced what we all already knew. That same year, she moved to Oregon to join her husband and became the medical director of clinical innovations for Lumina Hospice and Palliative Care, which is a community-based nonprofit organization dedicated to serving patients regardless of their insurance or ability to pay. In 2017, uh, Governor Brown appointed her as the Residential Ombuds and Public Guardianship Advisory Board, and she was selected as chair of that board earlier this summer. In 2020, she led a successful letter writing campaign to the Department of Health Services in Oregon's hospice organizations to ensure that patients at the end of life in long-term care could continue to receive hospice and family visits during the pandemic. She's a Pacific Northwest convert, enjoying puddle jumping, forest running, mushroom hunting with her kids, her husband, and various senior rescue dogs, keeping the theme of geriatrics going. I am so honored to present Helen Gao this afternoon. Thanks, Becky. Um, I wish this wasn't on Zoom because I would love to see all of the familiar faces that I used to see all the time. Um, but with that, I'm going to launch right in. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about caring for the future, supporting the caregivers on whose backs we lean. I have no disclosures. I'd like to start by asking you to consider some of the core geriatric issues that we address all the time as geriatricians. Might be day-to-day -day function, falls, perhaps social activities, loneliness, dementia behaviors, skin care, nutrition, end of life care. How many of these are possible without engaged and skilled caregivers? What if we had to access, what if we had access to one-on-one -on -one care so that people didn't fall? What if caregivers were better paid if they had specific dementia training and skills to creatively address our dementia patients with behavioral problems so that we didn't have to resort to sedatives? What if everyone who was dependent on care could access the caregiving that they needed when they needed it? I venture to say that investment in direct care workers in our country, both in fostering sufficient caregivers for our aging population and equipping them with problem solving ability, empathy, and skills to be successful is worth more in clinical outcomes than many of the new medications, hello, aducanumab, uh, and interventions offered in medicine. To bring you back to my beginnings, when I completed geriatrics fellowship, I wanted to practice in a community setting to learn everything I hadn't learned in fellowship. So I went to work at the Over 60 Health Center, a federally qualified health center that provided low-income care, care to low-income older adults in Berkeley. The Over 60 Health Center was founded by Gray Panthers, an activist movement started by Maggie Kuhn, who had been forced to retire when she turned 65. The Grain Panthers are still very active today, and it is a movement committed to combating ageism and achieving social justice through intergenerational cooperation. Fast forward to 2016. I moved to Oregon, and Gabe and I had our two kids, Vienna on the left and Mateo. This thrust us quickly into navigating the ins and outs of childcare. In looking up hourly wages, I was shocked to learn how little a nanny made. My husband and I committed to paying a living wage with sick leave, vacation time, and retirement benefits. But when our kids were old enough to go to daycare, I found myself trying to reconcile the fact that the amazing women who were engaged in my children's daily development made minimum wage, which at that time was about $11 to $12 in Oregon. Separately, I also learned shortly after moving to Oregon that Mark Muradami, the president of the California State Board of Optometry, had seen a long ago blog post I had written about the negative impact on homebound elders caused by the board's position disallowing optometrists to provide home-based services. As a result of our conversation and the old blog post I had made, the optometry board changed its regulations to enable home-based optometry services, a huge win for homebound adults across the state, and a change that made me realize the power of stories and advocacy 
even when it felt like no one was paying attention to that issue. In moving to Oregon and seeing mostly hospice and consult patients, I saw a broader range of patients and care conditions than what I had practicing mostly primary care with my own patients in California. This included adults being referred to our hospice for failure to thrive, similar to this woman featured in an AARP spotlight on COVID-related failure to thrive and isolation. Yet when our hospice staff and volunteers made a point of seeing these patients during meals and hand feeding them, some of these patients regained weight, began to perk up, and discharged from hospice. In joining a hospice team for the first time in my career, I worked hand in hand with amazing CNAs who I've observed providing exquisite, compassionate, highly skilled care. And yet I came to learn that they sometimes can't make their ends meet. The year after moving to Oregon, I was appointed by Governor Brown to the State Advisory Board overseeing and advocating on behalf of the long-term care ombudsman. I quickly learned the huge need for reforms in the long-term care industry as a result of the thousands of complaint investigations and resident advocacy performed by over 140 citizen volunteers who serve as certified ombudsmen in Oregon. The caregiver workforce support uh, is a priority of our board, and I have spent time interviewing direct care workers as well as long-term care administrators. Earlier this year, in partnership with other stakeholders, we urged our legislature to pass a bill to require minimum staffing ratios in long-term care facilities. I provided testimony that understaffing in facilities was leading to premature death, with no better proof than the fact that we could reverse a patient's hospice failure to thrive by sending our staff to feed them. Senator Gelser, who authored the bill, used my testimony to help legislators realize that understaffing wasn't simply leading to long waits and inconveniences in care, but to actual harm and death. Unfortunately, the legislature ended up cutting out assisted living facilities, but they did mandate staffing ratios for memory care. So it was still a huge win for Oregonians. In my presentation, presentation today, I'm gonna be talking about how we recognize the critical role of caregivers in our aging society, understand the reasons we face a huge caregiver workforce crisis, and learn how we can advocate for policy and legislative changes. I'll be using the words caregiver and direct care workforce interchangeably. In the United States, we have 4.6 million paid caregivers and they come under all of these various different labels. The direct care workforce is actually now the largest workforce compared to other occupations in the United States. We do have 53 million unpaid caregivers with 79% of them providing care for adults over the age of 50. However, that's a topic for another discussion. I'll be focusing today on the paid care workforce. We know that 70% of adults who reach the age of 65 are going to need severe long-term service and support needs before they die. And by the year 2034, the population of adults over the age of 65 will outnumber those under the age of 18 in the United States. This is a quote from some of the interviews that I've conducted. I feel respected by patients and families, but almost never in a professional setting. I think CNAs in any setting receive little to no respect, nor are they ever empowered to ask or demand it. As an example, I am often told, you should be a nurse. I get the intention behind it is not malicious, but the implication is that this is not a real job or that it is beneath me. I find myself being embarrassed at times when I tell people that I am a CNA. If you've paid attention to the news in the past year, you're probably aware of efforts to expand social care as part of the Biden infrastructure bill. It was cut out of the proposal, but the underlying point that I echo in all of my advocacy is that direct care workers do the work that makes all other work possible. Direct care work is real work and caregiving is not just a quote, labor of love or quote, woman's work, two terms which devalues caregivers. Just this past Friday, I made an urgent consult to a woman who weighed 250 pounds due to steroids, had pathologic fractures in every extremity, and who in the span of a week went from being able to transfer herself from bed to power chair to being bed fast from new brain metastases. While I could give a whole other presentation on palliative and hospice care, my point in this story is that no one on her cancer team over the, over the course of a week's appointments for CAT scans, MRIs, oncology, and radiation oncology 
Consider the fact that she was new, newly bedfast and her family and caregivers had no idea how to turn, roll, toilet, clean, and dress her, being 250 pounds and having two broken arms and two broken legs. She was soaking herself in urine while the family tried to shove briefs against her groin because they didn't know how to turn her. She lay on her back on a plasticized harness for one week, and they were lucky she happened to be constipated the whole time. Whether it's someone like this who needs total ADL help, or someone who has withdrawn and is persistently anxious, or someone with challenging dementia behaviors, we rely on families and direct care workers to provide compassionate, skilled, and cognitively, physically demanding labor. I never knew he could be bathed so tenderly. This was a comment from the daughter of a man with dementia who was frail and perpetually, quote, grumpy and angry, who rarely let anyone provide personal care. So as you are all aware, the shift to move patients out of hospitals and from nursing homes into the community over the past decades has led to higher levels of acuity and complexity in all care settings. And as a result, direct care workers carry new responsibilities and require additional technical and interpersonal competencies compared to generations before them. How did we end up where we are in this crisis? Long-term services and supports were institutionalized into the fabric of our country by the Social Security Act of 1935 and the subsequent Medicaid amendments of 1965, with the recognition that people with disabilities need care help. Medicaid was designed to provide institutional care for persons with chronic conditions or disabilities. But then with the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 and the Supreme Court Olmstead ruling of 1999, these affirmed the civil rights of individuals with disabilities to live in their own homes and communities and placed the responsibility on public programs such as Medicaid to uphold this right. As a result of these acts and rulings, long-term care became a foundational industry with significant public funds and the direct care workforce became a necessary part, not only of facility care, but also home and community-based services. As I noted earlier, the direct care workforce is already the largest workforce in the United States. The long-term care sector is actually expected to add 1.3 million direct care jobs during these 10 years from 2018 to 28. These are more new jobs than the second and third occupations with the highest job growth combined. So let's now look at the reasons we face such a caregiver crisis. I'm going to start by talking about the grave situation the caregiver workforce shortage is having on job conditions in long-term care and residential facilities. Of course, we know that problems existed long before COVID. This is the top 10 complaints fielded by Oregon's Long-Term Care Ombuds Office in 2019. Shortage of staff is always in the top 10 complaints. But when I parsed out other complaints, I found that five of the other top complaints generally involved staffing levels, staff training, or staff performance. So this was an article that showed up in my geriatrics news feed in this past week. Not surprisingly, I think we would, we would say that patients who are, are approached with slow, thoughtful care are more likely to respond positively than if they are rushed in their care. A quote from my interviews, they were starting to serve lunch at 1130 and they were still serving lunch when I left at 1245. When I first went into the dining hall, there were 14 residents and one caregiver. Multiple residents in the dining hall appeared to need total assistance with care, with feeding, and the caregiver appeared to be doing the best she could, washing hands in between delivering trays and starting to assist people with feeding. And another quote, she was literally running from resident to resident. In Oregon, our regulations state that facilities must have qualified awake direct care staff sufficient to meet the 24 hour scheduled and unscheduled needs of each resident. And while there are acuity tools for facilities to use, as you can imagine, this type of quote regulation leads a huge room for interpretation. One executive director that I interviewed said that when he worked for a memory care, the, the industry administration would not allow him to staff more than one caregiver at night for 36 residents with dementia. 
And as we all know, how many patients with dementia have normal sleep-wake cycles? In one assisted living facility in which my staff entered to provide care for a patient, they found that there was only one med tech and one caregiver on a swing shift for a 95-bed facility. There are 38 states and the District of Columbia that do not have any requirements for minimum staffing ratios. 12 states in yellow have a requirement for minimum staffing ratios. During the first quarter of 2021, over half of states' nursing homes did not meet the 4.1 recommended minimum hours per resident day recommended for residents to receive sufficient clinical care. I'd also like to point out that that 3.92 total nurse staff hours, 83% of that is provided not by RNs, but by CNAs. When facilities are short staffed, the workers and residents both experience negative outcomes. We know that this workforce crisis not only exists because caregivers are burned out from short staffing and having to work a lot, but there's also tremendous disservice in the poor compensation because minimum wage is not a living wage. A typical family of four needs to work nearly two full-time minimum wage jobs each to earn a living wage. And a single parent with two children needs to work the equivalent of three and a half full-time jobs, more hours than exist in a five-day period to earn a living wage. Three-fourths of direct care workers earn less than an average living wage in their states. And from 2010 to 2020, the average American wage rose 27%. Direct care workers in the same similar period, their median hourly wage rose 19 cents. Here's a snapshot of the average caregiver wages in my town, Corvallis, and San Francisco. So while you might say, great, they make more than the minimum wage, they aren't making a living wage. In 2021, in-home support service providers in San Francisco made $18 an hour. This is only two thirds the wage they need to actually live in this city. No wonder that so many family members who have to give up their careers to become IHSS workers or loved one are in poverty. In most circumstances, I've never felt appreciated for the work I do. As a CNA, respect is almost non-existent. We are told, you don't know anything. You're only a CNA. Your job is to wipe butts. For me, the biggest challenge is financially. I typically work a full-time job and work two to three part-time jobs to make ends meet. 46% of direct care workers have employer-based health coverage compared to two-thirds of civilian workers in the US. Fewer than one in six direct care workers receive retirement benefits from their employer. And 31% of direct care workers have paid sick days compared to 61% of all private sector workers. A huge disservice to the millions of workers, especially during this pandemic, who have contracted COVID infection as a course of their job. Direct care workers have three times the injury rate of other occupations in the United States. And this often comes from lifting or repositioning clients, or sometimes due to violence by clients, other per personnel, and from animals. Despite the workforce shortage, we lack a functional workforce pipeline in this country for recruiting, training, retaining, and advancing the careers of direct care workers. Ideally, I would love to become an RN. I have completed my fair share of college credits. But the reality is that the pay scale of this profession necessitates me working full-time. I personally have found that doing this kind of work full-time is not conducive to being successful academically. The physical and emotional toll makes it hard, but the most daunting is the lack of opportunity for advancement and feeling like I am stuck. In the National Academy of Medicine report, Retooling for an Aging America, it recommend, recommended that federal requirements for the minimum training of certified nursing assistants and home health aides should be raised to at least 120 hours and should include demonstration of competence in the care of older adults as a criterion for certification. But the federal standard has been stagnant at 75 hours and just over half of the states have chosen to require more than the minimum federal standard of 75 hours for nurse assistant training. 
13 states and the District of Columbia require a minimum of 120 or more training hours, the standard recommended by the National Academy of Medicine report. Despite the greater volume and complexity of tasks required by nursing assistants, 20 states still operate with requirements that have not changed in 30 years. Other barriers to direct care workers' career growth and advancement is that training requirements are not inherently stackable. There are no standard licensure requirements and workers often cannot work across settings unless they repeat training. So this is a tweet from UCSF's anti-racism initiative. We must take an anti-racist stance, challenging systems, practices and attitudes that maintain structural inequities against all people of color. With this in mind, I ask whether we as geriatricians are walking the walk in addition to talking the talk. This here is the American Geriatric Society's statement on discrimination. That was part of their AGS anti-racism initiative from August, 2020. If we hold ourselves to these principles, then we must recognize and address the innumerable deeply ingrained structural racism, gender inequality, and anti-immigrant sentiments that push down our peers who work in direct care. 87% of direct care workers are women. 59% of direct care workers are people of color. And 27% of direct care workers are immigrants. Almost half of direct care workers live in or near poverty. 36% of direct care workers lack affordable housing and almost half of direct care workers access some form of public assistance. You can see from this diagram that home care workers in particular, that 31% of home care workers are immigrants from other countries. This is compared to 17% of the total US labor force who are immigrants. One might think that federal protections for workers' rights and equal pay for equal work would address these issues. The Roosevelt Fair, Stand Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938 set the stage for minimum wage and overtime. But home care workers were excluded until an amendment in 2013, with protections not going into effect until 2015. And despite Equal Pay for Equal Work Act of 1963, gender discrimination occurs even within this female predominant direct care workforce with women of color making 10% less than white men. Workers unable to sustain and succeed in their roles burn out and leave direct care, sometimes going into retail where they can make more working at Costco than they can serving our grandparents and our parents. Consumers and care recipients have poor health outcomes and struggle to find high quality, consistent care. And employers, facilities and agencies are unable to find and keep workers that they need to meet the growing demand. So how do we advocate for policy and legislative changes to fix the caregiver shortage and address these inequities? There was a long history of activism among direct care workers trying to combat structural racism and inequalities. As professionals who work with aging adults, especially those becoming dependent in care, we have a responsibility to include direct care workers as valued interdisciplinary members of our patient's care and to advocate on behalf of justice for their rights. So how are laws made? What I love most is that laws begin as ideas. Stories can move a legislator and those legislators are going to seek experts such as yourselves to help them fit answers to discrete problems. They will ultimately need to ask what are the financial implications and the downstream implications of any bill that they author and propose. It's helpful as advocates to know who might oppose any bill proposals and to develop coalitions of like-minded stakeholders to provide effective advocacy. It's also helpful to know when do you actually need to change law versus when do you need to go directly to an, an administration or an agency to change a bad policy. This was an email that I got from Representative Rachel Prusak in Oregon, who happens to be a nurse practitioner in Portland's House Calls Providers Group. 
and she had authored a bill to mandate services to address pandemic-related loneliness in long-term care facilities. She wrote, unfortunately, this bill did not make it out of the Ways and Means Committee last session. This is not uncommon for new bills that will likely have an associated cost. Typically, a policy will take more than one legislative session to make it through the building. This bill was an important part policy for my patients and for long-term care residents across Oregon. It highlights the importance of infrastructure and investment in our long-term care facilities. And it is my hope that this bill can be reintroduced in the 2023 session and moved over the finish line. I share this because it can feel daunting and slow to move legislation. Believe me, I have felt like I've been hitting up against a wall multiple times. Sometimes you will face repeated setbacks with bills that die in committee or never make it to a vote. But every story shared with the legislator and administrators and every attempt to craft reform that can help move the needle and educate the rule makers is a win. Some federal policy proposals that you might want to keep in your mind as you think about ways that we can advocate to support direct caregivers, um, I'll list at this point. So there are efforts for the federal government to support Medicaid to ensure that long-term care providers receive adequate reimbursement rates to deliver quality services and improved direct care jobs. Of course, then on the state side, we need to be sure that states then have mandates that the higher rates of reimbursement coming from the federal government are appropriately passed through to the workers and not collected in administrator um, pockets. We also, um, my board has worked with our state's caregiver union to request that direct care workers in publicly funded home and community-based services and long-term services and sports have a wage floor based on a living wage and not minimum wage. Home and community-based services um, can be expanded and strengthened by a recent proposal called the HCBS Act proposal to provide funding to states um, that will strengthen HCBS infrastructure and further invest in home care workforce. The goal is to abolish the Medicaid institutional bias as well as make HCBS mandatory in every state. The bill would also address training, career advancement, recruitment, retention, and innovation. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services should incentivize states to build minimum standards for direct care jobs into contracts with providers and managed care plans. CMS should also guide states to invest in the direct care workforce through value-based payments. Value-based models should sound familiar to all of us working in geriatrics and palliative care, as it's these types of care models. Oops. Hold on. What happens when your kid starts playing with your power cord? Uh, let's see, so value-based models should sound familiar to all of us working in geriatrics and palliative care because it's these types of models, which we know can improve quality of care outcomes, but reduce costs. It's important for us as we think about value-based models to include the direct care workforce in the equation of care outcomes. Um, this past year, Congressman Tom Sozi proposed the Wellbeing Insurance for Seniors to be at Home WISH Act. This was to assist individuals with the high costs of long-term care and help transform and fully finance direct care jobs. This proposal did not advance out of committee, and I'm not optimistic that in this climate that it would succeed federally. However, Washington just became the first state recently to put into place a public social insurance program. I think the geriatrics field can also place ourselves as advocates for pathways to citizenship given the higher proportions of immigrants working as direct care workers compared to other US occupations. Our government should also allow visa programs for direct care workers that don't tie a worker's immigration status to their employer. Government agencies such as BLS, US Census Bureau and Health and Human Services should study or provide grants to survey uh, immigrants working on what's called the gray market which is where consumers directly contract and hire home care workers using private funds. 
In addition to a living wage floor, we can support the American Families Plan to expand affordable education and care, tax credits, and paid leave. This not only helps us, but it helps direct care workers. And finally, we should push Congress to enact and fully fund the Domestic Workers' Bill of Rights Act, which would provide a number of rights and protections related to compensation, worker protections, sick leave, discrimination, privacy, health, and safety. The Direct Care or the Direct Creation, Advancement and Retention of Employment Opportunity Act is a proposal to invest $1 billion over five years in workforce training, recruitment, retention and advancement opportunities for direct care workers in high needs areas. And the Improving Care for Vulnerable Older Citizens and People with Disabilities through Workforce Advancement Act, which is a mouthful, would build the evidence based on advanced role models in direct care, specifically integrating direct care workers into, into the interdisciplinary care team, into models where workers improve the support for individuals with complex chronic conditions. CMS, the Administration for Community Living and the Departments of Labor and Education and related stakeholders should establish a national standard for direct care competencies. Standards should apply to all workers, regardless of payment source. And there should be minimum training standards that ensure parity with home health aides and nursing assistants. The Direct Support Worker Training Reimbursement Act could increase federal matching funds for training programs specifically focused on direct care workers. And there was a bill proposal that would fund competency-based upskilling training to ensure that direct care workers have an opportunity to advance in their careers. Finally, Health and Human Services could help states mandate dementia care competence among direct care workers. This is something that I'm involved in on a state level with the Oregon State Plan for Alzheimer's and related dementias. Finally, a word in terms of training about apprenticeship. Expanding apprenticeship opportunities and local and state levels is a start. Traditionally, apprenticeships have existed for male predominant trades based on an old sexist presumption that men are the breadwinners. Apprenticeships are designed so that the apprentice can earn a living wage while training so that they are not left with educational debt and, and they can have continuing advancement opportunities. There is no reason other than poor will and lack of private public partnerships, why direct care worker apprenticeships can't be developed and part of the National Apprenticeship Registry. In Oregon, we have some early uh, efforts to start apprenticeship programs with assisted living facility um, uh, companies in Oregon, along with the union that sees caregivers um, to provide apprenticeship opportunities at a trial basis. Finally, we need to reform the long-term care industry. We need to mandate that facilities pass increased Medicaid reimbursements directly to workers. We need to demand safe staff staffing ratios accounting for acuity. And I would put out there that acuity levels must not only account for medical and functional needs, but also the social needs of individuals as well. So how do you get involved? Tell your story, lend your professional expertise, and serve on relevant boards. These are among some of the, the biggest players um, pushing for reform for direct care workers and in long-term care. California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform right here locally in your neighborhood. Long-Term Services and Support Center, the National Domestic Workers Alliance, PHI National, and of course, your state long-term care ombudsman office. With that, I hope that you leave today moved and inspired to create change in the same way that I've been moved and inspired to help people around me and to advocate for the direct care workers that we engage with every day when we work with our older adults. And these are my emails, both in Oregon and at UCSF, and I will take questions. Fantastic, thank you so much, Helen. That was tremendous. And let me get my video going here. Start my video and do the share. Um, so you're getting lots of comments about amazing, inspiring, um, and uh, let me ask you a couple questions here. So thank you so much, Helen. Um, you've touched on, a little on this already, but 
what are some of the lessons you've learned from your advocacy work and how you might recommend those that are new, newer to policy? Like, how do we get started? Like, you know, what are some of the things you wish you knew, you know, years ago? Or yeah. Before? yeah. Well, um, so I think the first thing to, to know is to find, um, so if you, for instance, were to subscribe to any of those organizations I just mentioned, many of those are very actively engaged in legislative advocacy and policy advocacy. I think as a standalone person, you may have no clue what's being proposed out there and when you can lend your voice. So I think there's different ways that you can um, serve in advocacy role. One is simply if you see something, for instance, you know, I, if I take that optometry example, you know, I, for me, that was just crazy, you know, like why, why can't optometrists in California see patients in the home? Um, and, you know, I didn't know about advocacy back then. I, I didn't, had no idea, I wouldn't have gone straight to the board of optometry. So I just put it in a blog post and I can't remember, it wasn't Jerry Powell, it was something, it was something else. Um, and, uh, and those stories make an impact. And I think that when, um, administrative personnel um, who are the rule makers for policies and when legislators hear stories, especially if you're one of their constituents, um, if it moves them, and they won't always be moved, but if it moves them, um, they'll want to know more and it at least starts a conversation. I think in terms of following um, bill proposals, at, you know, a lot of the proposals I just listed to you, many of them have already died in committee and have not advanced further. But as I mentioned, the whole legislative process is iterative. They come up, they die, they come back up in another version, you know, two years later at another cycle. And so if you kind of stay on the listserv of some of these advocacy organizations that are doing the work for you, you know when they're coming up and when these bills um, are open for public comment um, and or if you have a relationship with any of these organizations, um, as a public citizen, you can simply look up on your state or the federal uh, congressional website um, and submit public comment. Um, especially with things happening by Zoom now, it is very easy to provide sort of in-person Zoom testimony, but they will always accept letters and statements. And so as you know, faculty from UCSF, geriatric specialists, um, researchers in these fields, um, our weight, our, our voice carries a lot of weight. Um, even if it's an anecdotal non-scientific story, such as the one I presented about, hey, this patient was dying and sent to hospice, we went in and all we really did was fed this person and look, they survived and came off hospice. So those are the impactful stories that can help legislators understand the issues. Cause you know, they're, I mean, Rachel Prusak in Oregon, obviously she's, She's a geriatrics focused nurse practitioner, so she knows the issues, um, but most legislators you know, don't know all the issues. How do we get the stories to the legislatures? I mean, I saw they, they saw your blog, but is there some way more than chance? I mean, is this something we should be doing in terms of reaching out or, or building relationships with legislatures or? Um, well, uh, I now have relationships with certain legislatures, but you know, in the beginning, and even now, because, you know, the legislators change, it's just, you just email them. You just look up on your state or your federal, you know, website. Um, all of them have an email, and they might not be the one to respond to you, probably not. It might be their, you know, policy analyst, but um, you can request meetings at any time. So if you have a concern, you think that there's some crazy making law out there that doesn't make sense, um, if it's a if it's a legal law issue, then I would just send an email. Uh, that's what I've do, done many times. Just send an email to your legislature, request a meeting, um, and tell your story. Um, if you are more specifically wanting to craft an actual bill, then that's where you need to have a little bit more research done in terms of what might be the implications, who is going to oppose this, how do we get you know bipartisan support for it. Um, uh, and that takes a little bit more effort. But I think that first steps um, is just to reach out to them and ask them for a meeting. And that might, meeting might be five minutes or 10 minutes. Um, it might not be with a legislator, it might be with a policy analyst, but sometimes the policy analysts know the issues way more than the legislator. And so they will ask good questions. Great. And there's some questions about CNA training. So um, 
Ann Chodas talks about that Homebridge in San Francisco, IHSS workers, has a CNA training program to improve ca career trajectory and retention. Um, they said normal uh, normal IHSS caregiver turnover is about 80% per year, and Homebridge is down to 60%. So anyway, that is, are there things that we should be doing? I guess I don't even, like, what is the, if you wanted to be a CNA, what is sort of your trajectory um, or like in terms of training? So you find a training program, are those hard to find? How yeah, I'm cost? glad you brought up Homebridge uh, yeah. because that actually is a, a, a really great kind of local regional example of um, trying to make things more sustainable for caregivers and CNAs. Um, you know, a lot of CNA training happens in long-term care facilities. Um, you know, long-term care facilities have their own, quote, trainings. That's why training is really varied in terms of quality, as you can imagine. You know, med tech training happens in facilities. Um, and uh, so, um, you know, I think that's where advocating for trying to standardize things, ensure that, you know, the people teaching the trainings are, are qualified and are teaching appropriate curriculum. Um, and ensuring that, say, one assisted living facility that is providing training, if that person, say, wants to move out of long-term care into uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities work, that, that, you know, that there's some transference of their skills into the next, um, you know, next type of uh, direct care work. Um, so when I said that they weren't inherently stackable, I think the problem with certified nursing assistant uh, career supports in this country so far, you know, uh, to give you an example, we have certified nursing assistants in our hospice, as every hospice does, um, to work as hospice home aides. Um, some of them have been working as CNAs for 20, 30 years. With like this much difference in their salary from when they started to where they are now. And it's not that they haven't wanted, you know, I mean, I can tell you that Mary Beth, who was in that picture I showed you, she is, she is the woman who that daughter said, I have never seen my, my father bathe so tenderly. Um, she has incredible skills. I mean, I, I, it's, it is mind numbing to me that we don't consider this skilled because she can go in and she can work with the most difficult, crotchety, angry, you know, um, frail person and provide a beautiful, loving bath and experience. Um, and I think we need to recognize that and also recognize that you know, someone may not want to be a nurse. I don't think the automatic trajectory is you're a CNA, you must become a nurse or an LPN. Um, you know, so there are other ways that CNAs can advance their careers, whether it's going into management, into administration, becoming med techs or pharmacy assistants, et cetera. So I think that whether it's through apprenticeship or through um, uh, more clear trajectories of training options that give them uh, educational advancement opportunities. You know, that needs to be structured. And I think from a retention standpoint, I think Homebridge is really excellent for that. It doesn't necessarily open up the doors for what possibilities they may have beyond working as kind of in-home support caregivers and such, um, but at least from the standpoint of giving people a sense of um, pride and value in what they do, I think that goes a huge way. Are there places that are giving people like these extra certificates in dementia care that you could say, you know, I want to have that caregiver and I want to pay that caregiver more because of their expertise? Or is there any? That's a great question. And I, and I did not look up to see if there are states that sort of have a dementia certification. Um, I mean, I know that some memory care facilities kind of do their own again, in-house sort of dementia training. Um, and certainly as a state, Oregon does require people living, working in memory care to have some, you know, quote, additional dementia specific training. I think what's crazy to me is that, um, you know, so uh, personal support uh, workers, which is often in the IDD community, so intellectual developmental disabilities, um, those direct care workers, um, they often have a much more defined, that certainly in Oregon, sort of uh, stepwise gradation of the skills and uh, expertise that they have and, and the types of clients that they can work with. Um, and in the IDD community, the IDD community is much more um, explicit that direct care workers are not only involved in ADL help, uh, IADL mm -hmm. help, but are also part of that, their clients' occupational and social functioning. And when do you ever see as part of CNA training, you know, that, that our CNAs for long-term care or memory care, 
that part of their training is about supporting our memory care, you know, assisted living patients with socialization functioning like that that's not it's not explicitly you know detailed in that way and so i think that there's some things we can learn from the idb community i think that there are things that um that uh you know as some of those bill proposals have suggested that we need to have a federal guideline that says that if someone is going to work in a nursing home or work with dementia patients or memory care that there are explicit requirements for dementia competence um, in the same way that, you know, we're trying to geriatricize everything else. Like, you know, these are the core people at the front lines. Like that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. And Meredith Green, kind of on this, you know, asks, have you, is there thought about need for more regulation in assisted living? Uh, you know, what are your thoughts on the balance of the increasing regulation of assisted living versus maintaining the social less medical environment, um, which, is how they began. Yeah, you know, I think that there's a lot of sort of fear, and this is often the pitch from uh, the American Healthcare Association, which represents the long-term care industry uh, and our Oregon Home Care Association that represents assisted living, you know, about this sort of medicalizing, you know, um, I, I think it's, it's a wrong angle to say that having regulations to ensure that there are adequate people to provide for the functional and social needs of people in assisted living is somehow going to medicalize them. And like I said, we, we need to think beyond direct caregivers and CNAs as purely doing function and, and medical tasks or paramedical tasks. You know, uh, why do we not think of assisted living facilities as being the places where we can help people blossom in terms of their social relationships and um, uh, uh, and recreational engagement, you know, so, so the staff that are involved, uh, how they're trained, what we are staffing for um, needs to go beyond, you know, how many minutes does this person need to brush their teeth and, you know, get dressed to, you know, what does this person want to do with their day and how do we support them in that, you know, beyond like the one recreational assistant who brings everyone together to, to you know, play bingo. <laughs> so. You know, and kind of on that, I loved your idea that medical or acuity or a number of hours shouldn't just be based on their medical situation, right? There also should be their other the other social factors that go into that. How receptive have legislatures or like, you know, thinking about, because our group is really interested in how to measure some of the social determinants of health and things like that. And, and thinking about how to bring that into an acuity or hours thing is really interesting. Yeah, I will say that that is not something I have pitched, <laughs> but but it is something that I think about all the time and trying to figure out what is the right, I mean, I would be happy right now if we had simply the basic minimum, like I said, to feed people, <laughs> if, to feed people, especially when there are, you know, the, the looming uh, threats of a pandemic or such, like we need to be able to take care of, yes, the basic ADL necessities that people have. I think when we get to a place where we have sufficient direct care workforce and we have created opportunities for people to not only be able to be sort of medically functional focused CNAs, but direct care workers like in the IDB community who are focused on the social and the recreational well being of older adults, you know, then I think I would absolutely start pitching for, you know, mandates that assisted living facilities don't just park all their residents in front of the like 1950s movie that they shown for the fourth time. Um, I'm being very cynical here, yeah. but. <laughs> but I know we, we, you speak to our hearts. So we're, we're, we're trying to figure that out too. I was just interested because you've done so much on the policy stuff. You know, we've, anyway, it's really interesting to think about how to move some of the stuff. Yeah, that we're all passionate about into the policy realm. And that brings me to the next question that uh, Jeff Newman asks is have you involved organized medicine in advocacy? You mentioned a lot of the different organizations. Is there like, you know, are there any, I mean, I don't know if the, the American Geriatric Society or AMA or there's other groups that have taken this on at all or work with you? Yeah, and, and that's, that's a great question. And I knew that question was going to come up. And, um, and I will say that, you know, I think all of us have a certain bandwidth. I've decided to focus my energies primarily in the state of Oregon, just because I feel like right now I know certain legislators I have I can have impact there. But I do think some of these big policy proposals and initiatives um, on the federal level, I absolutely think AGS 
um, you know, NHPCO, the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization, AHCM, AHPM, you know, they, they should all be involved. You know, in, in particular, you know, I'm really excited by the prospect that, um, you know, that CMS and private payers and, uh, and uh, you know, stakeholders are beginning to like think and talk about the language of value-based models that incorporate the direct care workers in long-term care facilities or memory care, because uh, it's long overdue. Um, you know, they, these are tremendous opportunities to pilot things that could show, you know, benefits. And maybe some won't work and some will, but um, if that helps to pay for a facility in memory care to have better staffing, um, that's going to be way better than the next Aricept prescription that, that, you know, I'm asked to prescribe. So I'd be all for it. Excellent. Um, so I'm thinking about, you know, ways we were doing a project uh, trying to figure out how to help. Sometimes it seems like it's some of the middle income patients that have the most trouble because they don't qualify for certain subsidies or, and they don't have, you know, en enough money to pay for this home help or additional caregiving. Thoughts on that? I mean, I don't know what, in terms of the legislature, there's thoughts on how to help sort of that middle, that group in the middle. Um, yeah, well, I think, you know, Washington's social insurance program has just started. And I think it will be really great for us to kind of see with time what their experience is with it. And I think that for those states that are like Washington, a little bit more progressive in terms of um, social issues, um, you know, that that this is an opportunity to consider on a state by state basis, developing um, a state social insurance program to, to cover things like long term care, you know, that the tax, I forget what the tax percentage is in, in Washington, but it's, it's not huge, you know, and, and their model is more of a catastrophic model. Um, I think that the one proposed federally by um, Congressman Sozi was more of a, you know, like basically everyone pays in and then you get to you know, have long-term care benefits like long-term care insurance for either home-based care or facility care. Um, and I will say that one of the things that I think um, I would hope that California ventures into, because this surprised me and I was pleasantly delighted when I got to Oregon and found that in Oregon, if you are on Medicaid, um, you are not, you're not limited to long-term care in nursing facilities. Medicaid in Oregon will cover individuals, you know, who, who truly cannot uh, make it at home with HCBS services to go into uh, foster homes, you know, what in California we call board and care or into assisted living or memory care facilities. So having that huge variety of long-term care facility placements for someone with, um, you know, with increasing frailty and dependency is is amazing because they don't all have to go to a nursing home and it's yep. easier to wow. support that. And why California isn't doing that, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in, you know, finding out. Cool. And then uh, Meg Walhagen from School of Nursing says the American Academy of Nursing expert panel on aging is working on nursing or nurse staffing and payment in nursing homes and long-term care and focus on related policy in terms of partnering with any advocacy in the, on the nursing side. Um, any, I don't know if you have any updates on that. It was more of a comment, but. Um. Yeah, um, I mean, I think that, um, I mean, I, I follow a lot, you know, Canner, California um, Advocates for Nursing Home Reform a lot, because at least certainly within the state, but I think that their voice does have a, a national impact. Um, and then long-term, uh, oh, I'm blanking on the name of it. Um, I'll have to email it to you, but. Um, you know, so I think that there are organizations that are working in this arena in terms of um, nursing staffing ratios, because as I said, you know, there are there are recommendations uh, and I don't think people are willingly falling short of them at this time, you know, during COVID, people are sometimes falling short because they just don't have the staff, you know, in, in Oregon, um, I was really sort of saddened to find that, you know, our DHS um, uh, announced that they were going to loosen the requirements for uh, nurse staffing and that basically if you were a nursing facility and you had PTs and OTs and um, and basically just other staff, you know, who are not CNAs, who are not RNs, but you didn't have enough RNs and CNAs that you could start to count those, you know, just as long as you had some bodies to help turn a patient, 
was, and I think for me, like I understand the dire situation that facilities are in, but it's another example of sort of devaluing the, the skill of CNAs and the work that they do, because I can tell you that there are a lot of physicians out there who don't know how to turn a patient, how to put on a diaper, change a diaper, you know, do a bed bath. And probably the same goes for other, you know, non-nurse staff in a, in a long-term care facility. So. The other thing I was really struck by that 70% of people over 65 are going to need long-term you said long-term supplemental services. Services and supports. Do you think people know that? Um, I'm all, my a lot of my patients are always like, I ate, you know, I did everything right, I ate well, I exercised, and yet here I am, I'm have I'm having disability. Why? You know, this it, it you know, I mean, it, it seems like sometimes I think we we think if we you know do all these things that, that somehow we're we're magically not going to have any type of disability. And so I don't know how to get that message out that yes, you need to do. The, the healthy things makes the disability later, um, but but you're you're still likely going to need that. So you know, making it really raise to the importance of this. Yeah, I think that um, well, one, I think that there's still, unfortunately, I would I I would wish you know being in geriatrics now for for 15 years or so that it was different, but I think people still are mis, have a misconception that Medicare will take care of their social needs. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of the work that like medical legal partnerships, um, Hastings, um, in terms of advanced care planning, that is not just about you know medical care planning, but financial planning, powers of attorneys, wills, trusts, uh, all of that stuff in terms of, you know, did you, have you thought about and planned ahead for where are you gonna live and who are you gonna get help from? And all of those things um, are, are really kind of amazing things that uh, our division has been involved in over the years to push that conversation forward. Um, and certainly in my own clinical practice, it's something that I, I always address, you know, beyond just, you know, post form or advanced healthcare directive is what have they thought about, you know, like how are they gonna manage care if they're starting to, you know, become dependent and such. Um, and, you know, those are not common conversations in general primary care, and they, and they probably should be. Um, Great. Well, my last question will be, you know, trying to improve the work, or increase the workforce, train the workforce, build the respect, build the wages, um, all that. It, it's obviously a multifactorial thing and can be a little, you know, how, how do we, where, if you had to just sort of prioritize or just speak to the, the, the division, you know, what are some of the things you'd recommend people do? I know you gave that list, but what are, what are sort of some concrete things that you think, gosh, if you could at least incrementally start here, what would those be? Yeah, it, you know, everything is so tied together. So it is hard to, you know, cause, cause on the one hand, when I advocate for safe staffing levels, inevitably it's like, where's the money going to come from? And then, you know, where's the money going to come from to increase wages? And, um, and, and this is where I do feel some tension because while I'm advocating on the state level, a lot of this, because these are publicly funded, Medicaid funded, I mean, it does have to come from the federal government. Um, I, I, I think that, I don't know, there's no right answer. I mean, uh, there's clearly no loss of places that one can start advocating for these issues. I think to start is um, appreciating our CNAs and direct care, you know, direct care workers. Um, if you are in the position where you are hiring someone on your own and if you have the financial ability is to be sure that you are giving them a living wage um, and benefits and sick leave, et cetera, um, just on a personal level. And then I think, as I said, you know, it, you are seeing stories all the time in your clinical practice, whether in the hospital or outpatient, you know, house calls. And if you've got just some horrible, horrific story, like please just email it to, to your local, you know, representative or your senator, because it might not go anywhere, but at least it's kind of getting the story out. And um, and you don't always need to have the science and the data when you start. Like you just need that impactful story to get out there first when you reach out to the legislators, because that's what's gonna kind of hit them emotionally. And just a last question around HIPAA. Do you you can you, you can make it in a way that it's a story, but that's not identified? Like, how do you do that in a way? Yeah, I mean, I think there's lots of ways to do it. I mean, you could change the gender. You could. I mean, I, I dumb down different yeah. details a, a lot, but um, um, and you know, I, I've seen now more than one failure to thrive that perked up with feeding, and so I sort of blend the cases together and. Um, yeah. 
and it's kind of sad so to say, but story. when you see more than yeah, one. Yeah. Got it. So it doesn't have to be exactly yeah. the same, but, but really there's the purpose. So, well, this has yeah. been tremendous. This has really been tremendous. Thank you so much, Helen. We really appreciate your time and, and expertise. And, I miss uh, you all. We miss well, you I miss very you all, much. but Oregon is great. And if any of you would like to come up to Oregon, please talk to me about the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> Too funny. All right. Well, <laughs> take care. All right. Bye. Bye.